of Speaking, a monthly podcast on the spoken word, episode 20, September 2019, from Saturday Night Live to the present, a conversation with Lorraine Newman. Hello, Paul here with my latest podcast from Paul My Dialect Services and the International Dialects of English Archive. Since we last met, I've been honoured by the Voice and Speech Trainers Association, VASTA. It's an absolutely wonderful organization. I've been a proud member since it was founded. Most of IDEA's editors are also VASTA members, so as my more than 20 years of work with IDEA is a big part of that Lifetime Achievement Award, I'm going to share it with our editors. They send us the amazing accent and dialect samples for publication. I know a lot of VASTA members follow this podcast, so thanks, guys. Also this past month, I've been dialect coaching Treasure Island. It's a great stage adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's classic 1883 novel. The action takes place in the 1750s, more than 100 years before Stevenson was writing. It's been a real thrill to design the dialect palette for this historical piece. The pirate crew of the Hispaniola, the ship they took to Treasure Island, were from all over Britain and Ireland, but arguably it was Robert Newton in the 1950 film adaptation who established the uh, talk-like-a-pirate stereotype, and any dialect coach must take that tradition into account. Listen to Newton's wonderfully over-the-top turn as Long John Silver in a clip from that film. Top of the morning, gentlemen. Sit down at table to starve, but if he kindly will. For you, sir, piping a ha, and this be for Dr. Lindsay. Asking his pardon for being that familiar, but uh, Squire, he's told me so much about the two of ye, it comes natural to call ye by name, it do. And this'll be young Master Arkins, I'll be bound. Arkins. Tis a proper seafaring name, too. Eve at the anchor. We sails on the hour. Wonderful. Not... Jack Hawkins, or Jack Gawkins, but uh, Jack Arkins. Clip used under rules of fair use, all rights retained by Walt Disney Productions. Time now for Guess That Accent. Last time I played this clip and challenged you to say where on the planet the speaker grew up. The rainbow is a division of white, white, into many beautiful colors. This takes the shape of a long, round arch, that this path high above and its two ends apparently apparently beyond the horizon. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold and one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. When a man looks for something beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pot of gold and the end of the rainbow. So where was she from? If you guessed Poland, well done. The subject is a Polish Yiddish speaker. The family thinks from Loge. In the recording, Holocaust One, from Ideas Oral Histories Collection, the subject recounts how she hid from the Nazis in a barn in Warsaw for 30 months before being discovered. She survived to tell the story, emigrating to New York City in 1949. Search for Holocaust One on Idea to hear the whole amazing recording. It was contributed by Sean Mueller. He's the tech wizard who built the first incarnation of the archive back in 1997. Now here's this month's challenge. Where did this speaker spend his formative years? Well, here's a story for you. Sarah Perry was a veterinary nurse who had been working daily at an old zoo in a deserted district of the territory. So she was very happy to start a new job at a superb private practice in North Square near the Duke Street Tower. Give the answer next time on In a Manner of Speaking. My guest this month is Lorraine Newman, a founding cast member of Saturday Night Live and a member of the company for five years. Please read more about her by following the links on the In a Manner of Speaking homepage on paulmeyer.com. Lorraine, thanks so very much for sparing some time out of your busy schedule. What would you be doing today if you weren't talking to me? Have you got some current projects that are taking your time? I'm writing my memoir for Audible. 
it's interesting. They want to do humorous memoirs. And I've heard a lot of them there. Martin Shorts comes to mind. Mm. It's just delightful. And it's, it's really great because usually people who are going to write a humorous memoir are performers. And since we read them ourselves, it's really kind of a performance. That sounds great. Can't wait. That's what I've been doing. Great. Here's, here's just a, a highbrow kind of a question, more of a philosophical question. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think comedy is undervalued in our society. It's unusual, for example, for comedies to win Best Picture. And yet the masks of comedy and tragedy, the emblem of our profession, are of equal size. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the importance, humanistically, on the importance of comedy. Safety valve, something that helps us see the absurdity of our petty little human lives. What do you think? I, I don't know the reason that comedy has been so neglected in terms of, like, the Academy Awards, etc. I think that's changing a little bit. The fact that a movie like Bridesmaids even got a nomination is uh, a milestone. Yes. Especially when you consider it so... Uh, a female driven and probably groundbreaking in the sense that it was written by women. It starred mostly groundling women, I might say. Well, that makes you very proud. It does. And that it really exhibited the true nature of women's relationships. I, I will never forget when I was first watching it. And there's one of the earliest scenes in the movie is Kristen Wiig and Maya Rudolph together having lunch. And at one point, I think Kristen smiles at her and says, I love you. And she's got cake all over her face, <laughs> her teeth, you know. Mm -hmm. And then Maya says it back to her with cake all over her teeth. And that is something that I had never seen in any kind of movie, let alone something like that, which is truly the kind of stuff that we do when we're together. The comedy of life. Yeah, and I think that... Uh, all performance is cathartic for the audience. Yes. And with regard to comedy, I think basically it's telling the truth in a way that the audience identifies with. And a lot of times laughs are indicative of identifying. Even when you do character work, these are usually successful because people recognize those characters or you've created a character that's very unique and has a very unique perspective, and it's kind of like a revelation for the audience, giving them something they didn't know they'd want. Exactly, and I remember reading a quote of yours talking about the interaction between a performer and audience as a kind of communion. It does feel like that. Certainly when I was young and first starting out at the Groundlings, doing characters. I mean, it, it was a lot like SNL in the sense that we didn't know if anybody really was going to get us, see us, appreciate us when they did. It just makes you feel less alone in the world, I think. That's beautifully put. So when did you discover first your talent for character voices in comedy? <laughs> well, you can stop right there at talent because I'm still looking for it. <laughs> I think that I can pinpoint when I first appreciated and fell in love with and had comedy become my passion was when I was very young. It was something that was valued in my house to begin with. Uh -huh. But I was absolutely a television baby. I think the first thing that really inspired me was a show called Our Miss Brooks. Hmm. And it starred an actress named Eve Arden. And it was very ahead of its time in the sense that, you know, you had a female protagonist that did not suffer fools. And for the most part, the kind of characters of women you saw were Gracie Allen, you know, a show called I Married Joan about a, a ditzy wife or, you know, I Love Lucy. Mm -hmm. All these women are just kind of, well, silly, somewhat dismissed. Mm -hmm. But Eve Arden, her character was an English teacher, and the people around her were kind of the people that she had to deal with. And she even did takes to camera, which I think George Burns was the only other person that was doing that at the time. God, I sound old. Anyway, uh, <laughs> just, I, I just... I'm older. <laughs> I wonder. One of the things I loved about Eve Arden was her style of delivery. 
It was very dry, very sly, and, you know, a little bit passive-aggressive. That, to me, was really, really funny. And did you imitate her? Did you impersonate her? What, what's the deal? I don't know. I, I think I'm almost, like, absorbed her. Uh-huh. That there's a lot of my style that is just integrated into me. Yes. Not, I don't necessarily do an impression of Eve Arden, uh-huh. but her, her physical movements, her takes, her cadence, emphasis on certain words, I definitely feel I've just kind of metabolized. I understand. Comedy was valued in your house, in your household, in your family. Yeah. Did that come from the from the Jewish experience? Well, that's a given. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think that's been characterized and quite accurately that uh, Jews, I had heard this once that um, in the tradition of the Hasidic Jew, a child's first taste of honey is on a page of a book so that they learn to associate learning with sweetness. Mm. You know, since we were basically powerless and rendered powerless in so many ways, using our intellect was probably one of the things that we used to survive and flourish, dare I say. Yes. But I think that when you're any oppressed people appreciate irony a lot more than, say, a demographic that hasn't been limited and thwarted Mm -hmm. in their efforts to strive. Did you ever attend the uh, Yiddish Theater in New York? No, I am a California Jew, which is pretty much a Presbyterian. We are very plain rap. My mother was an atheist. My dad was born in Los Angeles, but he was raised in Arizona, and his family were cattle merchants. So they were basically cowboys. Hmm. We didn't belong to any temple. It was just kind of anything goes, very informal in my house. I remember um, when kids were going to camp, there was a, the Jewish camp was Hillel or Roosevelt, and we were sent to Camp Trinity. <laughs> so... That's the picture. <laughs> We're jumping ahead a few years. I, I, I have uh, discovered that uh, you wanted to study acting in England and applied to several of the schools that I once taught at, uh, Royal Academy okay. of Dramatic Art, RADA. And, oh, my goodness. And Lambda and, but, and Bristol Old Vic, I believe, is yes. listed as one of the ones you aspired to. Yes, they, they did preliminary auditions, and you probably read this. They did preliminary auditions where they see about 300 people and they take 80 out of that group and then the final they took 20 out of the 80 group and I never made the 20 group but I was there I mean I was in England doing these final auditions amazing so you took yourself off to Marcel Marcel of all people a speechless Lorraine Newman (laughs) yeah well I love the idea of getting laughs without words and I had already studied improv in mime when I was still living in LA as a teenager So when I got there, I actually had a lot more technique than most of the students there. Neat. So uh, you were an original SNL cast member from 75 to 1980, before it was even called Saturday Night Live, right? But NBC's Saturday Night, I think. Yes, until, well, I think in halfway through either the first year or definitely the second year, we were able to call ourselves Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I'm sure anybody who's looked into the history of the show knows that there was another Saturday Night Live hosted by, of all people, Howard Cosell. Yes, I read that. Yes, And, you know, I had only found out recently that people like Chris Guest were in his rep company. And, wow, you know, I mean, it's just a confluence of of, uh, arbitrary things. It was a a blessed moniker, obviously. Yes. So, how were you? Uh, you were still very young there. How were you able to learn at such a young age to jump from character to character and dialect to dialect in front of a live audience, a TV audience of millions? How was that? How was that experience? That's all I knew. That's what I had been doing in the Groundlings. All of us came from a background where you had to do exactly that. Yeah. Whether it's Second City or Jane was from the Proposition in Boston, you come from a sketch show where you're you finish the sketch the lights go out you run off stage you change your costume in our case the groundlings because 
most other companies didn't really use wigs and costumes like we did. You come back on in the dark, hit your mark, and the lights go up and you go, and that's exactly what SNL was. Yeah, and that, a company that's running to this day? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, the Groundlings are still, you know, alive and well in the farm team for SNL. You've said that your favorite character was uh, Lena Wittmuller. How, wow. how, how did that come about, and could, and could we hear a little Lena? Well, it was really she is Swiss, but I, for some reason, chose to do a Quebecois accent, and I don't know why. <laughs> that shows you how dollar ninety eight my approach approach was. <laughs> but um, I was fascinated with her. I loved her movies. She was just so outrageous and so original and unique. And I, I just saw an opportunity to wrap around my sensibility using her as the catalyst mm-hmm. so that I could do absurd stuff. Yeah. I'd like to talk about the differences between live acting and voiceover acting, uh, both things you do superbly well, especially when it comes to voice control and, and dialects. Is, uh, what's the differences for you between doing it live and doing it uh, pre-recorded? I can only speak from my own experience. You know, live television is different than on-screen acting also. it's These are all different techniques, and voice acting is obviously different as well. Live acting is a is, is, is stage. SNL is a stage experience. In terms of uh, film and television, for me it's always been kind of an unnatural experience. I'm always amazed by people who do it well because I was always very distracted by having to hit my mark in a certain spot, be in, find my light, find the camera that's on me and do the character and remember my lines. This was always very difficult for me. Mm-hmm. So with animation, it is a different technique in the sense that you have to convey a body type. Let's say I remember auditioning for box trolls and they wanted a slim woman and a heavy set woman. You know, you have to think about making your voice heavy you have to give some heft to it. Some, mm. oh, oh, maybe, I'm not sure, but... And then thinning out your voice, just knowing what that entails. That's really what voice acting is about. A lot of times, though, improv comes in very well because you can be given, especially for auditions, you're given an image, a physical description or an actual picture of what the character is, and in that split second, you need to make up your mind what kind of voice you want to use for it. A lot of times, some of the most successful voices are against type. You know, despite the fact that Seth MacFarlane created Family Guy, you would never expect a baby to sound like Stewie sounds. Mm -hmm. And that's just a perfect example of how animation works versus on camera. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I... uh my f- first professional gig was uh, with the BBC drama Repertory Company. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did a uh, couple of years with them playing as cast. You know, you'd show up on a Monday morning, get in your get your scripts for the week and uh, do two or three radio dramas. Uh, oh, that, sounds- uh, that was an amazing ensemble work. You know, there were 25 men, 25 women, and, oh. and uh, we'd have guest stars like... Uh, Richard Burton and Dame Flora Robeson and you know you name it and, and we we the uh, the studio players would would back them back them up and sometimes play leads ourselves but I loved voice acting ever since I was yeah. a child voice acting since we had no television in our house and we listened to radio drama on the BBC radio coming to us from London a hundred miles away and, uh, and I just I've just spent my life in with voice and speech and and the the oral side of, of the mm-hmm. art, so I'm very much sympathetic to your great love of the of the work. Improv and uh, so working without a script. I'm, I'm, I wonder if you could explain your love of improv. Um, it's working without a script, you're the author and the character. It's hugely yes. powerful in that way. Is is that the attraction for you? Yes, that's exactly the attraction because I don't really consider myself. An actress. I don't really feel like I am willing to adhere to the job description because it does involve exposure on a level that I've never understood how to do or was willing to do. 
So for me, uh, broad characters, characters that I've written, or animation characters are much more comfortable for me to do. I love the craft of bringing to life, in the case of animation, a character that you're going to see and they will have no idea who's voicing it. So people won't know that I'm that child. They won't know I'm that teenage boy. They won't know I'm that 80-year-old Russian woman, you know? Yes. So how do you work? Do you uh, model on life? Uh, Do you sometimes start with a real person and take it further and further and distill the essence of that real person? Or does it all spring from your imagination? It's both. A lot of the characters I came to the Groundlings and eventually to SNL with were people that I had grown up observing, like the Valley Girl. Yes. You know, I had a friend named Sybil, who was actually from San Francisco, but <laughs> and she she would in in writing it's T S A S K that sound and she would do that before ever saying anything, which I thought was so interesting, and I noticed that people from the Valley. And I think it's also because of, uh, you know, the, yeah. and the Okies, the people from Oklahoma and the Dust Bowl migrating here, yes. the Spanish population, which are basically land grant families and the people that settled California. I think all of those English speaking dialects melted into one. And you can point to my version of Valley Girl, which would like her endings, her INGs and their contractions of couldn't would be couldn't or wouldn't would be what, and shouldn't would be shouldn't, and ING's, I'm going, I'm going down there, you know, yes. like that. I, I was always fascinated how, uh, by that dialect, and it really, you know, it was amazing to me how much it caught on and how people did various versions of it because they recognized it. I thought a lot about the Valley Girl dialect mm-hmm. because... Again, it, I did the original one. I mean, this is not to brag. This is merely to say that my, my, not to brag, like, thank you, world. You're welcome. <laughs> um, it's just that it's, it is different from the one that is commonly known because this was the one from the 1960s and 70s when I first started hearing it. Yes. And we have like a lot of swallowed owls and California. <laughs> and, and, it also kind of bleeds into a surfer speak too, but that's a whole other thing because it is not surfer speak is not quite valley, but a lot of uh, the valley stuff is really a loose jaw too, like uh, you know you're constantly kind of just your jaws really loose and stuff, and then you have kind of that interrogative lilt and stuff. Yes, yes. No, you're you're speaking to the value of the craft exactly. So, which leads me on to another idea. You know, we have these two ends of the performance spectrum, perhaps actors at one end and and comedians at the other. You know, characterization versus caricature is at at opposite ends of that spectrum. Acting and impersonations are at the end. You've sort of hinted that that you think of yourself as residing only at one end of of that spectrum. But they are two different arts, both valuable. Um, Yes. And you... I, I would have to contradict you and say you you do both brilliantly. But what would you say about the two different ends of that performance spectrum uh, and their value to us? We're talking about just dramatic acting versus comedy. Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, acting, I mean, we can tell when someone has absorbed a character and is wearing a character um, and, like a cloak and disappears inside it. And you really... If, they, if it's done well, you cannot really tell that they're acting. You know, they, you think that's the person. Mm-hmm. But, but at the other end of the spectrum, it, we always know there's a kind of a wink and a nod to the audience that, that, the, uh, that we're actually wearing a disguise and we can sort of see through the disguise. So it's uh, two different art forms, I would maintain. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess one, uh, you know, the one that you can see through is usually <laughs> comedy. Yes. And the one that you can't is is uh, dramatic. Yeah, yeah. I've been fascinated by, you know, how how one could take, you know, could take a Scottish accent and uh, in a heartbeat you can flip it from acting to impersonation. You know, I, I could do, um, uh, you know, a Billy Connolly um, 
and, and absolutely skewered the guy, you know. I was, I was walking down the street and I saw a dog. <laughs> And, you know, but then you, but you can, then you can take the same script and, uh, you can, I was walking down the street and I, you could see a dog there and I was this woman with a, with a dog and suddenly I'm not skewering the accent. I'm not, not mm-hmm. lampooning the Glaswegian, mm-hmm. but, but it, I, uh, giving a tribute to it in a sense or taking it on as a, I don't know, in a different spirit. I am fascinated by the Scottish dialect, and uh, I have a friend who is a pretty well-known voice actor who is also on Reno 911 named Carlos Alazraki, and he's from Northern California and does one of the best Scottish accents I've ever heard, and he knew how much I loved the dialect, so he gave me, and this is how long ago this is, he gave me tapes of Rav Nesbitt. I don't know if you remember that show, but the dialect... I don't. It's a comedy show, and basically the the main character is a drunk. But his dialect was so thick that it had subtitles for the Scottish people, too. <laughs> and it's just amazing. And I've always noticed that uh, frequently Scottish actors do very good Russian dialects, or at least they can approximate it, like uh, David McCallum. I didn't realize he was Scottish. Interesting but, how now you mentioned Scottish and uh Russian in the same breath, they do share some signature sounds, the, mm-hmm. the trildar and the, and the, and the dark L. You're, mm-hmm. you're looking lovely today, my dear. You're, yeah. You're looking lovely today, my dear. You know, they share the same <laughs> sounds, but two different. They're in the same family. Yeah. They're in the same family. Yeah. So you, you and I first uh, met through our mutual interest in accents and dialects. Tell me what's your approach to, to doing an accent, to acquiring one, to, to becoming skillful in it. Is there a technique for you um, or, or is it simple mimicry? It's simple min- mimicry, although there is a dialect coach out in here, Los Angeles, who who teaches how to write it phonetically. And I also learned a lot from your book and the recordings. For instance, if you wanted to say the word world with a Scottish accent, hmm. uh, you would say world. Yes. And it's written out that way so that you can actually just see a, a language code to adhere to. But also, I mean, growing up in L.A., I grew up in Westwood, which is right near, well, it's where UCLA is. So we had people from all over the world in our neighborhood. Yes. My best friend, Vicki Hartsock, was from West Virginia. And her mama was always pregnant, and her brother Robbie would leave toys on the floor all the time so that her mama would have to bend over and squash the baby. <laughs> and uh, we went to. Uh, and you just you just absorbed that by osmosis right through your pores. Yeah, yeah. and you know, as an adult, a lot of my um, kids' friends' parents were South African. And they were Jewish South African, which is a different dialect. You know, they were like from Durban. I had an orthodontist who had taken some (laughs) x-rays. He came after the x-rays and he he said to me, I can see you take immaculate care of your teeth. And I never thought that. It became like a key for me. (laughs) A little mnemonic. Yeah. Neat. Do you you have a favorite accent? Uh, And do you have one that... You're still working on? I'm still trying to, you know, I get hired to do a Scottish dialect. I know the flaws in it, so I will not be doing it here. <laughs> um, I do get hired to do British and, and Scottish dialects and it, by Brits, which amazes me. But I know that it's still very flawed. But for fun, I'm still trying to work on that uh, South African accent because... You know, I can hear myself going into uh, New Zealand. I can hear myself going into yes. us. And I know that I've gone off course. It's yeah, um, I mean, We mentioned the similarity between Russian and Scottish. And uh, there's a huge resemblance between Cockney and Australian, as I explored in a previous podcast. I have so much trouble deciphering between Manchester and Yorkshire. Mm-hmm. There's so much from my ear similarity to it but again those dialects i i adore them and i just wish that i that's what happens is i can hear a london accent i can hear a cockney accent i can hear a a northern 
Manchester Liverpool accent. I can do them, but then I veer off course and I can hear something else coming in there. And so I, I can't say that I do them that well. Mm-hmm. If we were to think back decades to Sid Caesar's generation, all the comedians did accents. You, you, it seemed to yeah. me you could not be a comedian if you didn't do accents. But it's yeah. not, not so much anymore. Why do you think that is? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you a Milton Berle story. When we were doing Saturday Night Live, he hosted. He, uh, Lorne Michaels hated him so much that that show is not in anywhere to be found. Gilda and Jane and I were posing for a picture with Milton Berle. And he said, give me a little soft shoe to all of us. And we said, well, we're, we don't really know how to do that. And he was like, what do you mean? Where's your talent? <laughs> Which was really kind of heartbreaking because we all, you know, grew up with him and really admired him. But he Uncle was Milty. so mean. But it's true. I mean, you know, you had to have, you had to be able to do everything. You had to be able to sing and dance and do comedy, and those those things have like fallen away like the stages of a rocket. Mm-hmm. I'm most impressed by, you know, a lot of the New York actors are on Law and Order, and you never realize that they're Broadway actors, so they're singers as well. It's always like this big revelation. Mm-hmm. I think Jesse, uh, oh, I can't remember his last name, but like he was in one incarnation of Law and Order, and I found out later that he was a Broadway star. Mm-hmm. You know, and Audra McDonald, is that her name? She's on uh, The Good Fight, which is an, uh, mm-hmm. done by the same people that did the show The Good Wife. And I've seen her as an actress in a lot of things. I had no idea that she was a singer. I think that the last bastion of people that have that many elements to their talent are Broadway performers. Interesting. Child voices, which you do so brilliantly, old age voices. Uh, oh, thank you. Do, you. do you have tips for an aspiring voice artist in, in going into that territory? It's so funny. Billy West, he's uh, Ren and Stimpy. He's Futurama. He's ubiquitous. People would know him if they heard him. He said something one day that I will never forget. He said, it's amazing that there's this little piece of tissue in my throat that I'm making a lot of money with. And that's what I'm thinking about when I go from like a child to an old person. I don't know why I can do these things. I guess I'm just a parrot in a way. In terms of tips for actors, I don't know if you have to have an inherent aptitude for dialects or not, and for voices or not. I don't know if that's something that can be taught, so I'm not going to rule it out. I just know for me, it wasn't taught. It was a passion. Fortunately, I had an aptitude to match up to that passion. In spades, in spades. Talk us through the process for voicing animated films. Most people kind of have... um, the image of Robin Williams at the beginning of Mrs. Doubtfire, mm-hmm. uh, voicing to picture uh, that's already been shot. Are you referring to Aladdin, not Mrs. Doubtfire? No, he, he starts off with as being fired as a voice artist at the beginning oh, of Mrs. Doubtfire. I really forgot that. Yeah, that's, that's the yeah. very, very first scene. He's, he's fired day one for for well, uh, think- do, doing an anti-smoking commercial when <laughs> when the parrot is smoking a stogie or something like that. That's funny. I did not remember that. But I think a better example would be him in Aladdin because, yes, yes. you know, they record you first and then they animate. Yes. Uh, sometimes it's their guide track, but either way, they allowed him to improvise. And, you know, they're, they're a, that is an absolute aspect to voice acting. I know a lot of the actors on uh, Futurama, like John DiMaggio, and even Rob Paulson, who is, I think he's Pinky and Pinky at the Brain, and Fairly Odd Parents, and Animaniacs, you name it. Mm-hmm. SpongeBob. He absolutely improvises, and he's hilarious. These people really do have a facility, and someone like Tom Kenny, who started out as a stand-up comic, he's now SpongeBob, 
He started out as a stand-up comic, and he absolutely, every show I've ever worked on with him, he has added something so funny. And then it's drawn, the uh, the pieces is animated around that, right? Yeah, yeah. He will add to the script, and they will accommodate that if, if it works, you know. Mm-hmm. Is it, is it typical for an artist to voice several characters in a project? Oh, yes. And when you're working, do you keep switching back and forth between character like you might in an audio book? Or, or do you record like, all of the uh, character A in a batch and then all of character B in a batch? Or how, how does that work? You mean, can I talk to myself? <laughs> yeah. I'm not good at it, but I've seen people who are amazing at it, like Rob Paulson, like Frank Welker. It's like being a drummer. You know, if you've ever seen that drummers have to keep a different activity with all their extremities that don't match one another, it's the same thing. It's like rubbing your stomach and patting your head. I've Mm -hmm. done it, but I'm not as good at it as as many others. (laughs) Well, Miss Newman, Lorraine, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure. And thanks to you for joining Lorraine Newman and me, Paul Meyer. Join me next time when my guest will be my son the film critic and executive editor of IDEA, Cameron Meyer. He and I will just have returned from the Telluride Film Festival, so we'll bring you news from that most important event in the movie maker's calendar. But our main topic will be dialects and accents in the movies. The good, the bad, and the downright ugly. Next time on In a Manner of Speaking. <laughs>